All right, let's get back to uh, the napkin dream. Uh, we are talking about the life of Joseph. We launched this series last Sunday, talking about the life and uh, story of jo Joseph uh, and his dream, and we are calling it the napkin dream. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's, uh, it's a story of a guy who had a dream, an amazing dream, and was betrayed by his brothers, uh, was sold into slavery, and then God picks him up from there and helps him to rise up to, to, uh, to, to, to power, unexpected power, you know, power, uh, unparalleled power at that point of time, because Joseph literally was running the whole world at that time. At that time, Egyptian civilization was the one that was ruling the whole world, the known world at that point of time. Pharaoh, by the virtue of being the king of Egypt, becomes the ruler of the world. And Joseph, by becoming the prime minister at the end of his life, um, you know, in, as he moved into Pharaoh's palace, he was the one who was literally running the whole world. Imagine a guy who was betrayed by everybody, uh, went through really tough times in his life, probably uh, at times wondered whether his dream will ever come into fulfillment, uh, and, but he stuck to what God is trying to do in his life, chose to follow what God is, where God is leading him, and God uses every experience in his life in order to help him to accomplish his dream. I'm sure all of us have dreams, our own dreams. We call this the napkin dream because um, our goal, uh, you know, we just wanted to ask you this question. If I give you a napkin in your hand and we ask you to write down any dream that you have for your life, what would you write on this piece of napkin? By the way, how many of you have the napkins? How many of you? Did you pick up? All right. If you, if you didn't pick up last week, today is a good day to take that. If you picked the last week and still forgot, that's probably why you don't have a dream. You know, our goal is this, that by the end of this series, even though you, if you have a dream, we want you to write down. If you don't have a dream, blank napkin is a good place to start. By the end of this series, we hope and pray that God would give you a dream, a dream that would change your world, that would change the world around you, that God would use you to change the world around you. Uh, a, a dream that would, in fact, bring healing to your own family through you. That's what God did with Joseph. Joseph, even though was the one who got really hurt by his own family, in fact, at the end, was the guy who, through his own dream, brought healing into his family. Not just into his family, but the world around him. So who knows, God can use your dream to restore your family, to heal your family, the broken family, and, uh, and um, use your life to heal people who are broken and the world that is broken around you. So I pray that um, during this, this series you will catch up um, you know, uh, um, with, um, with this dream that God, God has for you. You will I know, um, catch that in your heart and that if you already have a dream, that you would begin to see how Joseph changed, uh, God changed Joseph's life from a dreamer to be a person who actually sees that dream to come to fulfillment. Uh, you will learn from Joseph's life, um, learn from, uh, from the mistakes he made, from the good decisions that he made, and that you would uh, you know, follow those, the steps of Joseph in order for you to see your own dream to come to fulfillment. That's our prayer for you. But I want to, uh, everything begins with this important understanding. Listen to this. That God has a dream for you. That you're made to make a difference. That's what we talked about last week. If you don't believe that, you won't, you won't begin to dream for your life. Only people who feel special, only people who know that they are special, will be the people who will start thinking bigger than themselves. Start having bigger dreams. In the sight of God, you are special. Each of you, each of us, is special in the sight of God. God carefully knit us together in our mother's womb. He watched us as we were being formed in our mother's womb. In the darkness of that womb, he saw us with love. He knew every single day, even before it was formed, came to be. So God has a very special place for you in his heart. Meaning, you're special to him. So therefore, don't, don't, don't limit your life to mediocrity. Start thinking bigger than yourself. Because your dream should be bigger than yourself. As long as you stay at the center of your dream, meaning as long as you keep talking about yourself, you keep saying, my dream, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to achieve this, the longer you stay in the center of your dream, the longer it takes for the dream to come to fulfillment. That's what we talked last week. 
It's time for you to move out of the center of your dream and allow God to be at the center. Then you'd begin to see the dream that you've been dreaming start making progress. That's where I left you last week. But here is the big idea today. This would lead to our step one from Joseph's life. The big idea today is this. Pride will get in the way of your dream. Pride will get in the way of your dream. Pride will come and stop you from progressing. If you allow pride, self-exaltation, if you allow self-righteousness, if you allow uh, you know, self-importance to fill your heart, you would stop from progressing. In fact, you will start seeing that everything that you value in your life is getting destroyed around you. And that's what happened in Joseph's story, and I want to talk about that. This is chapter 37. Let's go to chapter 37. I'm going to read a little bigger, uh, the, the passage is a big, big reading, but uh, it's important for me to read that for you. Let's look at this. When jo- uh, verses 12. This is after Joseph had dreams, spoke to his brothers, spoke to his dad. Now brothers have gone out. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture his father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, jo- Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him away on his way and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area um, um, noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. Well, I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told him. They moved on from here. I heard them say, let's go on to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. Uh, we, we We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into the empty cistern in the wilderness. Then he will die without, laying, without our laying a hand, a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So Joseph arrived. His brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he's our brother and our own flesh and our blood. The brothers agreed. His brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to, uh, sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, The boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat, dipped Joseph's, blood in his, uh, Joseph's robe in his blood. Uh, they sent the beautiful robe to their father with a message, look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Let me pause there. I want to make three statements about pride first. Before I go back to this story and begin to explain that. Three statements that you need to remember about pride. Pride blinds us to the truth. Remember that. Pride blinds us to the truth. These are the three dangers of of pride, a loving pride in our lives. Pride blinds us to all truth. Basically, what I mean by this is this, what I mean by that is this, that we stop noticing the weaknesses in our lives. We stop noticing the flaws in our character. When you allow self-importance to rule your, your life, you get blinded 
you get blindsided to, to your flaws, your weaknesses in life. That's one danger. The second thing about pride is this, and I'll try and show you, show that through, throughout the story of uh, Joseph to you. The second thing about pride is this, the danger about pride is, uh, of pride is this, the pride stunts our growth. Pride stunts our growth. It stops us from growing because we stopped learning. Remember that. The moment you think you know everything, and that's what we call pride, the moment you believe that you have learned everything that you need to learn, that nobody has to teach you anymore, or the moment you stop paying attention to what everybody is trying to tell you, and only you are the one who is talking, basically you stopped listening, therefore you stopped learning, meaning you stunted your own growth. Does it make sense? Pride stunts your growth. Number three, pride keeps you in a loop. Pride keeps you in a loop. You know what a loop means, right? That you keep repeating the same thing. That's called a loop. So here is what happens. You'll keep repeating the same mistakes again and again and again and again. Why would you do that? That's because you stopped learning. You stopped learning because you stopped seeing the truth. Does it make sense now? Pride blinds you to all truth, which naturally means you will stop growing because you stopped learning. That means you will keep repeating the same mistakes. Could it be possible that one of the reasons why you are not able to achieve your dream is because in spite of all new resolutions, in spite of all the new year resolutions that you kept making every single year, you keep repeating the same mistakes again and again because you never learned. Because you thought you already know everything. Could that be reason why none of us, some of us are not actually progressing towards the fulfillment of our dream? You see, pride destroys everything around us, including us. Let's get back to the story again. You see that Jacob is sending Joseph to check on his brothers. You see, um, Jacob, Joseph actually started off as a helper to his brothers. Chapter 37, when we first get introduced to Joseph, you'd see that Joseph was helping his brothers in taking care of the sheep. That was where his journey began. As he began to grow, father paid more attention to his son. We saw that last week. We talked about how there is a special bonding between Jacob and Joseph. Father treated him special. And the more father started treating him special, the more Joseph began to uh, you know, understand that he's different from his brothers. And that he's, uh, he's somebody unique than his brothers. And then he would begin to notice what his brothers are doing all those things that he's doing wrong, he's coming back and reporting to his father. The more he's doing that, the more father is giving him more responsibilities. At one point, as he gave him this beautiful robe that jo Jake, Joseph now started wearing and walking around, that robe symbolized the authority that father placed on his son, the youngest son among all the sons. Now Joseph, from being a helper, has now become somebody who is overseeing what the brothers are doing, and take the report back to the father. And that's exactly what Jacob asked Joseph to do. I want you to go find out where your brothers are, what he's doing, what they are doing with the sheep. I want you to see all the things that you can notice. Bring them back to my attention. Just report, report them back to me. At some point, brothers stopped doing their job well, and Joseph brought that report back to the father. Now, because of that bad report that Joseph brought, two things happened. One, Father began to trust him more. Jacob started trusting him more. Two, brothers started hating him more. That's what happened at the same time. Father began to give more responsibilities, offer more trust to Joseph. At the same time, because he's the one who's bringing the report about his elder brothers to the father, elder bro all the brothers, all the ten brothers began to hate him more and more and more. And so there is a distance that began to happen between them. Now, at this point, where we come in chapter 37, at this point of Joseph's life, Joseph is 17 years old, maybe 19 years old. He's now going to um, fulfill what his father has asked him to do, go check on his brothers. So he travels more than 100 miles, 100 kilometers, um, all the way to Shechem, only to find out the brothers are not there. They've gone to another place called Dothan. So he reaches to Dothan. As he's reaching there, 
something really tragic happened in Joseph's life. That was a, that was a, a pivotal moment in Joseph's life. It's a very important turning point in Joseph's life. That this boy who was coming down the hill to reach his brothers, or maybe going up the hill, I don't know what is happening there, but something happening there. As he's coming, brothers saw, brothers were plotting against him to kill him. Joseph doesn't know that something is actually happening there. Some plot is happening against his life. He doesn't know that. He's coming as a happy man, as a dreamer, as somebody who, is, who knows that he's special, as somebody who thinks that something great is going to happen with his life, only to come and encounter something that is really tragic, something that is totally unexpected. And he's now finding himself sitting in a pit, totally darkness surrounding him, absolutely no idea why he's sitting there in that pit. What he doesn't know was he could have been killed. But what he, where he is right now looks really dark, looks like all his dreams are shattered. He could, he could hear his brothers screaming as, uh, as they tore off the robe from him. Uh, with this one, one moment he was a dreamer, one moment he was the man with authority, one moment he was the favorite son of the father, the next moment he's a prisoner sitting in the system. Absolutely no clue as to why he's sitting there. That's what pride can do to us. That's my point. You see, it's easy to look at Joseph's life and feel uh, for Joseph because Joseph looks like a victim there. He was victimized. You know? we, 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 we can, sometimes if we are in Joseph's place, we can feel victimized. That um, as, as we see the things that people did against us, said against us, as they threw us into this pit, when we sit there, we can, like Joseph, feel like we are the victim. The truth is this, well, could it be possible that you are in the pit because of your own attitude? Because I'm sure Joseph is in the pit because of his attitude. Because he's got a problem. And the problem is called pride. Sometimes it's easy for us to blame our brothers for throwing us into the pit. Be blindsided to our own flaws. And think that everybody is against us. Nobody wants us to achieve what we want to achieve. Nobody wants us to achieve our dream. You know, uh, let us achieve our dream. Uh, nobody recognizes how good we are. Nobody recognizes our talent, and they push us into this 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 pit, this this um, this cistern. And you are sitting there. You 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 think that you are there because somebody else threw you into that. Could it be possible that they threw you into that pit? Because you have a problem with your ego. I think Joseph knew that. Maybe as he sat down, I don't know what happened in the pit. Huh? I'll go to heaven and ask Joseph that. I'm going to heaven, I don't know about you, but... Uh, uh, when, when I go to heaven. But I think Joseph is a smart guy. As he sat down in the pit, he began to recap his life began to look at what had happened through his life. And I think he kind of began to recognize a pattern in his behavior, an attitude uh, that really led him to this part, this point, um, into this pit. And that's what I want to focus on today. How pride can get in the way of your dream. How pride can stop you from progressing and, and um, make the very people who should have been around you push you into the pit. How does pride get in the way of your dream? Number one, pride pushes people away. Pride pushes people away. Arrogance is never attractive. I want you to know that. You could really be the smartest guy in the room. But when you say, I am the smartest guy in the room, nobody likes it. You could really be skillful in what you do, but when you start showing it off to others, Nobody will like you. The people who should have been your friends would slowly begin to walk away. Here is the problem with the pride. Pride may help you to gain fans, but it will definitely push your friends away. You may have 101 likes, well, not 100, 5,000 likes on your Facebook page. Um, you know, all the fans 
star, star fans, top fans, I don't know what fans you have in the uh, ACs and all that stuff on the Facebook, but, but the people you, sh you should have had on your side will definitely walk away from you because of your pride. You can impress people af from afar, you know, but when they come closer to you, if you're struggling with pride, the impact is very clear. They, they'll, you, you will begin to see that people, they get closer and then they start walking away from you. If you're ever wondering how come you don't have any friends anymore, could it be possible that they're actually walking away from you? Your attitude? When Joseph's brother saw him coming, verses 19, when Joseph's brother saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. How did they recognize him in the distance? Tell me, you are smart people, right? How did they recognize him in the distance? Because of the robe. Because of the robe. He doesn't know how many people are sitting there, what they are doing, but they could see who is coming. That's what pride does, you know. It's, it, it's, you may not see the pride inside you, but people get to see that very clearly. Even from distance, they get to see it. They start recognizing that inside you. And they'll, they'll they, you know, they, in this case, they began to plan to, to kill him. In our case, it could be possible that people begin to plan, I don't want to be with this guy. They made plans to kill him. Now, it does seem over the top, you know. But they hated him. Right from the beginning. First, because the father was treating him special. Second, because he was bringing all the bad reports about them to the father and trying to gain more special attention from the father. Third, because he's got the beautiful robe. That special gift from the father um, kind of put them at a place where they began to be more furious about him and then over the, uh, of the top of the, uh, on the top of that he began to tell them about dreams of how he will be, he'll be the number one. And they got really, they became furious about him. That now even at the distance, even the sight of him is inciting anger, so much anger inside them that they plan to kill him. You can't measure hatred like that. You know? Now I know Joseph is, I want you to know in this picture, in this story, um, Joseph is not the only guy who's struggling with pride. Even the brothers are struggling with pride. Both of them are struggling with pride. And I'll talk about that part towards the end of, of, of the sermon. I'll come back to that. When both of you start struggling with pride, you, you'll know, I'll tell you what happens. They start, they are also, you know, um, the people with struggling with, jealousy is born out of pride. They were angry that dad treated them, treated him special, not them. That's where the jealousy came in, you know. Their ego got hurt. Their ego got, got more, more hurt when dad gave them, gave Joseph the special robe. They, they, they got mad. They saw that dad, even though they are the ones who are above them, uh, older to them, uh, older to him, they are more experienced than him. But dad, is, dad gave the authority to Joseph you know, to monitor them. They got more mad. They, they became jealous. Their ego got hurt. It's funny. As I looked at that incident, I realized this. That a father did not give Joseph the robe, but gave to one of them, don't you think they would wear it? Among the ten? They all want to wear it. They are angry that they didn't get to wear it. That's called ego, that's called pride. Pride get. Pride pushes people away. You see, mm, why would everybody want to wear that special coat? Because this is what I realized. That we, in one word, it is this. That we all want to wear the coat badly because we think our identity comes from that coat. We think our identity comes from that particular job. 
we think our identity comes from that particular status in the society we think our identity comes from that particular home that we're going to purchase we think that our identity comes from that particular achievement that we achieve we think that people will begin to respect us give us importance because of that particular thing that special quote the one who has that thinks that he is he is the boss of the world the one who doesn't have that sees he is hurt because that fellow has it and he thinks that fellow doesn't deserve this i deserve that that quote we tend to draw our identity from what we have and what we wear i was um, i told you this series was born out of a conversation with one of my friend pastor called west davis and so while we were just talking about this particular incident um joseph's life he began to narrate a story uh, about in his own personal life that when he was in junior high school he wanted to wear the izod polo polo shirt you know the izod the crocodile thing um he wanted to wear that it's a very expensive one and he begged his mom to get one um because uh, he thought that would make him look special among all his friends so his mom went to store and bought um, as i know like all moms she went to buy one thing but bought a different thing <laughs> because she saw a better deal on another polo shirt again but with a different brand it's called the la tiger instead of the crocodile the alligator there is a um, tiger on the polo was didn't like it he said no 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 mom i i don't i won't wear this no it looks nice the polo shirt looks nice she he said no no i want only the izod one the alligator one and he insisted so much he refused to wear that shirt so much the mom finally caved in she went back to the store again but instead of buying a new shirt she went and found a new alligator patch like all moms she brought it back and over the tiger logo she put the alligator patch and sewed it in that's it now the la tiger polo shirt has now become the eyes odd one and gave it to him ves says when i saw that i couldn't believe that my mom did this and and if he and he began to refuse to wear it i said why 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 did you refuse to wear that the problem is this the alligator looks cool the only problem is it is four times bigger than the original logo i can't even fake it see our identity when we tie it up with what we wear and what people think about what we wear or what we have um that's when we allow pride to begin to rule our lives is it possible that it's god's way god's way of doing your napkin dream is to let your brothers rip off your beautiful robe is it possible that god's way of allowing you to move towards your dream is to take off the very thing that you are trying to find your identity in your job your position your home because the most important thing in your life is people but if if you all of the things and the positions and and all the uh, prestige that comes along with what you find your identity with if you allow that to rule your life it would push people away from you and god doesn't want that happen that to happen in your life pride pushes people away number 2 pride leads us to a pit of course that's what happened there it led straight to the pit I'm sure you heard this before the wise man said pride goes before fall. And this is how it worked in Joseph's life. Look at verses 20. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. Let's throw him into the pit. What is a cistern? It's a, of course it's a pit uh, that is that is um that basically they are hollowed out limestone beds bedrocks um so that these lime and and they're you know they're um they're plastered uh, so that when it rains they naturally start holding the water inside um 
uh, rainwater is mostly used during the dry seasons. But this particular time, at this particular time in their journey, in Joseph's life, you see that one of those cisterns is empty, dried out. There's no water inside. And whenever there are empty cisterns, they are usually used as temporary prisons to hold people inside. So here is Joseph inside that pit, the dad's favorite, the one who is wearing the special coat, now ripped off it, the one with big, you know, big, big dreams, uh, full of dreams, uh, the one with the sense of authority, um, who is coming to make sure his brothers are doing their job. Uh, in fact, when he was coming, he has no idea that they are planning to do that. Far away, they saw him, they began to plan. Joseph is coming towards his brother in probably daydreaming about how he's going to find all his brothers doing something foolish and how he's going to go back and tell his dad and how dad is going to treat him more specially. Maybe that's what he's thinking as he's coming, uh, as he's seeing his, his brothers from far away and moving towards them. What Joseph didn't see, he may have seen his brothers doing something foolish. He may have seen in his dream that he's going to find them doing something wrong. He may have seen in his dream that he's going to go back to his dad and you know, get more special things from his dad. What Joseph didn't see was the pit. Pride is a poor leader, you know. It blinds you from seeing your fall. The one that you're heading straight to. Because of um, our own sense of self-importance, we begin to deceive ourselves. You see, self-importance leads to self-deception. Remember that. It fills us with a, with, a, with a degree of entitlement. It convinces you that you are immune to the pit. Some of you are like, ah, well, Joseph didn't see that coming. I know it. I know it will come. I know how to avoid them. I already have a plan for it. When you begin to think like that, you are actually heading towards your pit. Because we think we are always the exception. That person may go to pit. This guy will definitely go to the pit. That guy may go to the pit, not me. I actually get the get out of the jail pass. We hope that we get, the, get out of the jail pass. We hope that God would punish all the other guys, not you. Because you are this Christian. The one that goes to church, the one that gives tithes. The one who prays every day. The one who reads one chapter every day in the Bible. The one who never swears, the one who never has any bad habit. The one who thinks that he's and everybody in his office well, I'm actually spiritual. I, I'm a good person. Do you know what Jesus calls people like that? You know that, right? Jesus has a very strong word for them. He calls them the whitewashed tombs. If you think that, well, in Jesus' case, Jesus is not really impressed with you, by the way. It take, to make matters worse, when we do end up in the pit, our pride keeps leading us, still leading us, so much that we find blaming the, uh, blaming the pit. It shouldn't have been here. They dug the pit at the wrong place. Or maybe you will start finding, uh, blaming people who threw you into the pit. If you couldn't find anybody, you will start blaming God. Um, we may see the pit as the cause of our pain, not as the result of our pride. I actually think pit, if you're experiencing the pit experience right now, your fall, I think the pit is a slap on our face by God to tell you, hey, you're being driven by pride. Like a good father who would give once, once in a while a good japa to us and say, get right. I think sometimes God also does that to us by throwing us into the pit. 
pit is a good place i want you to know that because that is where god can work in our lives if you have fallen because of your fr- pride and you you're stuck in the pit stay there for some time because then definitely they are not permanent ones um stay there for some time because that's where god can work in your life i have i have no idea have you ever thought about this i don't know if you ever thought about this that the joseph who went into the pit and the joseph who came out of the pit are totally different guys total different character different i i uh, attitude different mindset completely something happened inside the pit that's what happens um if you allow what you are going through right now the pit experience to be the place where you begin to make right choices you see it's what happens after the pit that's very critical as a leader you must make the right choice there inside the pit whether to continue to let your pride to blind you or whether you choose to humble yourself before the god who can bring you out of that pit this pit is a chance for us to repent of our own sin our own pride and let god change us if you want to if you if you want to become a a great leader in your life if you want to be somebody who makes a difference with your with your with your life let your pit experience be the place where god works on your pride pride pushes people away pride leads you to pit number 3 pride robs you of what matters to you most pride robs you of what matters the most this moment this particular pit moment changed joseph's life forever everything about his life is changed you see one moment before the pit he had a family he had a home he's got a job he's got dreams he's got the beautiful gift the next moment everything was taken away from him everything that he thought was of value to him was taken away from him so when joseph arrived the brothers ripped off the beautiful robe that he was wearing the act of them grabbing him taking uh, the, the, this 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 beautiful robe away from him ripping it off and throwing him into the pit it it kind of gave me a picture of what can happen to us when we allow our pride to continue to lead our lives it would take away what we value the most it's interesting what happened after that that these are some hardened guys huh? first of all they plan to kill him and it's because of ruben's intervention that they decided not to kill him maybe they were planning when ruben is not around we will kill him in fact as they threw him into the cistern the first thing that they did is to put a dining table nicely and sit down together and start having lunch and then making plans on how to kill him i mean cold hearted brothers they have come to that place because of what joseph had done I'm not saying they are right. I'm just saying they have become what they have become because of the kind of attitude Joseph threw at them. What they did is wrong. What they did is evil. And they face the consequences for what they have done, but at that point the the kind of coldness that they have developed towards their own blood and brother um you know you may you may look at this act Uh, of judah coming to his brothers and saying you know what's the point of killing this fellow is our own blood and flesh why should we have the blood on us let's do something let's sell him on to who i want you to pause and think about this moment i'll come to the ruben part also pause pause and think about that moment why ishmaelites you know who where ishmaelites came from right j- 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 these are the kids of jacob jacob is the son of isaac isaac had a brother whose name is this fellow this ishmael was thrown out of his own home 
he was taken away what was valuable to him from, you know from him and he was thrown into the desert to die ishmael these brothers definitely knew what's the point of killing this fellow if we kill him he'll just die but if we sell him as a slave to ishmaelites and if ishmaelites know who this guy is they're going to make his life hell see had they killed him joseph would have simply died but if they put him as a slave to ishmaelites they're making his life worse the act of what judah did may look a merciful act but it's actually sending him to really big punishment bigger punishment than dying in the system dying inside the pit that's how cold hearted they have become brothers i actually think the only reason why ruben didn't want to um to see joseph killed is because ruben had a bad reputation i don't know if you know this few chapters earlier ruben the first elder born the the first elder son did something that is prohibited by god something that you know a norm people in normal society don't do this that he slept with his father's concubine servant wife jacob had four wives you know that right slept with basically he committed what uh, we call incest he committed something that is hate hateful against i mean in the sight of god god doesn't like things like that so maybe by that act ruben lost his respect ruben lost his position as a as the guy who has the authority over his brothers lost respect in his father's sight lost respect in his brother's sight maybe ruben by rescuing joseph and taking him back to jos dave jo- uh, to jacob wanted to earn his way back to his to his eldership maybe he wanted to redeem himself by saving joseph so everybody has an intention in what they did that's my point that's what i'm trying to say nobody really wanted joseph to live they if one guy wanted him to live because he wanted to get his own reputation back another guy wanted him to live because he want him to suffer more but the fact is everybody hated him so when ishmaelites the midianite traders came by bible says joseph's brothers pulled him out of the system and sold him for 20 pieces of silver and so the traders took him to egypt that's what pride does it robs you of what you value the most he lost everything that he valued the most and now he has become worthless no value for joseph he was once the pri- uh, uh, the son that is looked upon with pride the son that was valued high is now become nobody that's what pride can do to you the thing that you think will bring you the importance when it is taken away from you nobody pays attention to you nobody and nobody absolutely nobody the job that you think is giving you the recognition the the position that you think that that brings you the respect of people people respect you not because of you they respect you because of the seat on you which on which you are sitting the moment it takes it gets taken away from you nobody pays attention to you if you allow pride to rule your life does it make sense now okay. number 4 pride splits families up pride splits families up not only pride ruins your life it ruins your family joseph was so proud of his own robe that he wore it for 100 miles 100 kilometers all the way to show off to everybody this is how good i am this is what i am to go to see his brothers joseph's brothers were so proud of their own Uh, 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 you know the, the, uh, uh, of uh, 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 of you know of 
of, of their status as elder brothers, that they couldn't accept what God is doing in Joseph's life. Both struggling with pride. Both have egos that they wanted to satisfy. Everybody wanted to wear the robe. Nobody got to wear the robe. Finally. Joseph was sold as a, as a slave, as a valueless person. Robe got ripped up. And this is what happened next. The brothers killed a young goat, dipped Joseph's robe, verses 31. Joseph's robe in its blood, they sent the beautiful robe to the father with a message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to, to whom? Your son. Your son. Didn't you notice that? The change, the, 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 you know, the first time, uh, the, in the first point when, when we read the verse where, where they saw the brother coming, he, he, what, what, did the, what was the first thing that came out of their mouth? Here comes the brother. Here comes the dreamer. Not the brother, the dreamer. The scorn inside their, their, their voice, you know, in, in that statement, you can see the hatred that they had towards them, towards them. Now, you can see the scorn more clearly when they send this robe back to the father. They're not even regretting the decision that they made with regards to the brother. They send back this robe and say, your son. Your son, not our brother. It's funny that, <clears throat> on a side note, it's funny that they killed a goat and sent the robe that was dipped in the goat's blood to Jacob. The guy who killed a goat took the skin of it to steal a blessing from his father. Interesting, yeah? How God deals. It always comes back to you, by the way. God has a very interesting way of knack. Uh, uh, you know, to bring back what you did in the past. Parents, listen. Unconfessed sins will come and affect our children. We better deal with our sins now because we don't want our children to suffer because uh, of what we did, whom we deceived, the kind of um, compromises that we made. We don't want our children to suffer because of that. The father is now suffering. He recognizes it immediately. This is my son's robe. He realized that. And the end of that verse, that chapter, verse 34, he mourned deeply for his son for a long, long time. The thing is this, if Joseph had died, it's fine. Joseph was living somewhere else. Father suffered, even though Joseph was alive, thinking that his son is dead. Look at the burden of our sins, huh? how they come back to us. Now, let's come back to the Joseph. We see that Joseph's pride in this dream is not only impacted in this story, is not, in his dream, is, is, is um, not only impacted him personally, but it has invaded his entire family. Pride never promotes peace. It only breeds jealousy and division. How many marriages are broken and couldn't be restored because of the two people who are involved in that most intimate relationship that you can find on the earth couldn't just come to a place where they could say, I'm sorry. Go back and look at all the statistics of, of uh, the, the reasons for divorces. And you will find it, the number one reason why divorces happen in the world right now, the number one reason is because one of them couldn't say, I'm sorry. That we let our egos ruin our relationships. That we let, our, we, we let our past hurts, our own hurts, our own ambitions, our own selfish needs destroy the very thing God is trying to build, our relationships and our marriages, families. Oh, how many broken marriages could be restored if one prideful spouse decides that I'm going to look past my hurts. I'm going to look past my ambitions. I'm going to look past my selfish needs and um, choose to make things right. 
It's not who, listen to this, it's not who is right or wrong, but it's who will make it right. That's the secret of good relationships. In the past one week, we had two, I think two of our, uh, our church members, two couples of, in our church, celebrated 20 years and 22 years of their marriages. If you pull them aside and ask them, what's the secret of your marriage this long? I'm sure this is what they would say. Forgiveness. They may not say in this, this exactly those words, but whatever they would say would lead up to that part, that particular point, that we chose to look past each other's, each other's mistakes. We chose to offer forgiveness. Could it be possible the reason your family is hurting right now, the reason your marriage is hurting right now, the reason you are not able to keep up good friendships or relationships is because you are, you are always about, I'm right, I'm right, I should be the guy who is right. You may actually be the right person, the one with the right opinion, the one with the right decision, the one with the right understanding. You, it could be possible that you are the right, you are the person with the right, uh, everything right. But it wouldn't hurt you a bit if you choose to say doesn't matter who is right who is wrong let's get it right as a couple maybe that's the right way to restore our relationships there are no simple and easy cures for very complex issues that we face in our lives in our marriages in our families be sure of this that there will always be enough blame to go around. But I actually think we find that there is very less of humility. You know, humility is in short supply in relationships. That's probably why there are so many broken relationships and marriages and families. Maybe that should be reversed now. Maybe in Capstone, families have plenty of forgiveness to go around. And less of blame to go around. And maybe we will let the humility that is taught by Christ teach us to subdue our pride, let go of our ego so that we can work on better relationships, better families, better examples of Christ-like husband and wife. God knows the world needs people like that. God knows the world needs people like you who would say, you know what, we are not going to let our egos hurt our families. We're going to check them aside. We're going to learn from Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8, Paul talks about the humility of Christ who being in the very nature of God did not consider himself equal with God but gave himself up to become like man. Like a slave, he says. Chose to go on to the cross, to die, on, uh, you know, to die, even to death on the cross, like nothing, he says. Imagine a God who created heavens and the earth, everything that ever existed just by the power of his word, chooses to become part of his creation, like you and me. Who are we that he should choose to become like you and me? That's why Paul is saying nothing. We are nothing. We are slaves. We are nobodies. He chooses to become like us, nothing, and chooses to take our sins upon himself when he doesn't have to, when he has all the right to punish us, chooses to take that on the cross for, our sin, for us so that we now can be set free from our sins and live free. He doesn't have to do that. He did that. That's the supreme act of humility. And that should teach you and me that there is no bigger person in a marriage, in a relationship. That you are not too big to say sorry. Looking at this God who chooses to do that, you should be the first one who decides as a Christian. If I really have Christ in me, I'd be the first one who would say, let's make it right. Does it make sense now? You see, your family is worth fighting for. Your relationships are worth fighting for. Your wife 
your husband is worth fighting for. Because God fought for it. He fought for it on the cross. He fought for, he is fighting for it right now. You see, at the end of the day, he's still for you, your family, your dream. So you can trust God to bring healing to that part of your life. What becomes really difficult for us is to actually lose the rope. That's, that's step number one. If you want to see your dream to come into fulfillment, let me finish up with this. Step number one, lose your robe, keep the dream. Lose the robe, keep the dream. This is how Joseph took his first step towards his dream. That's the only way he could begin to make the progress. He chose to lose the robe, robe sorry, and keep the dream. Well, he didn't choose. Somebody ripped it off from him. But at least he got rid of the robe. But we didn't have to wait till somebody robs it off from us, right? We can lose the robe. Leave it here today at the altar, on that, on that chair that you're sitting right now. Leave that robe there. Go back with your dream in your heart. You'll begin to make the first progress, progress towards your dream.